to the Seattle Mariners 2020 Women in Sports panel. This is an opportunity to spotlight the important role that women uh, play in sports and how their contributions to the game really help transform our world. I am Angie Mentink. I will just be facilitating things today, uh, just tossing up uh, softballs, if you will, so that our amazing panel can knock things out of the park. And um, really what I think uh, will be an illuminating round table with some very accomplished women from different parts of the world in sports. Obviously, we generally do this event at uh, T-Mobile Park, but this year is anything but normal, no doubt about that. So uh, we brought the panel together virtually, and even though uh, we can't have our audience with us this year, we have collected questions um, from uh, some amazing people that have been part of this event in the past, and we have uh, collected that, and we will, we will pepper everybody with those questions throughout the afternoon. So let's uh, meet the panel and we will do it in alphabetical order because I am neurotic. And if you would like, you can see my closets and my pantry just to uh, make that point. We will start with Amanda Lee. And uh, what I get most excited about when I think about the future inroads for women in baseball, it's because of people like Amanda Lee. Um, these are the barriers that need to continue to get knocked down the most. She was hired by the Mariners in 2019 as the first female on-field staff member in organization history. Um, she interned for the NBA Oklahoma City Thunder's D-League team, and I promise, uh, Amanda, that we will all try not to hold that against you, that you have helped the Oklahoma City Thunder in any way, um, because you can hold on to our basketball team, but we will never forget that they should be wearing green and call the Sonics right here in Seattle. Um, and also, as I introduce each one of you, and Amanda, I'm gonna start off with you. You can just sort of give us the highlights of, of the, the why and, and how you got into sports and, and where you are now. Yeah, so growing up, played sports. I played softball. Unfortunately, I just really got burnt out on it. I played competitively. I was go, go, go all the time. So I kind of switched gears to basketball, loved it, loved everything about it, especially since it was climate controlled indoors with air conditioning. That was my favorite part. I'm sure my mom can attest to that as well. So played basketball, was really hoping to go to college to play basketball as well. And I got injured, unfortunately, like a lot of us do. I had surgery on both of my legs, was super intrigued by the whole process, like wanted to know everything. My mom thought I was so weird she was like you have to stop watching these videos of the surgery they're going to do on your legs tomorrow like you're going to freak yourself out. i was like no i want to know what they're doing so super intrigued by the whole process long story short but is what really kicked me to choose baseball is one i love the sport and two i saw like right after my surgery um there was a breaking news at the bottom of espn and it said sue falsoni was the first female athletic trainer hired in one of the four major sports so nfl nhl nba and mlb and i from that second i said i'm going to be the second obviously that's not true anymore but that is still my goal so i've always had interest in sports getting injured myself got me interested in being an athletic trainer and then sue falsoni is definitely my why of i want to work in baseball she set the example for me Awesome, Amanda. All right, so uh, next up, uh, we have uh, Jessamyn McIntyre. And in the broadcast business, one thing you want to have is bandwidth. And uh, Jessamyn is uh, like the horizon. That's, that's her bandwidth. <laughs> um, we only have so much time, so maybe I should tell you all the things that she can't do, but I'll just hit a couple. Um, she was at ESPN headquarters in Bristol for a handful of years, working on uh, several national shows. She is currently the executive producer for 710, ESPN making Danny and Gallant look like geniuses. Um, <laughs> she is the sideline reporter for Washington State football, and she also has served on uh, the sidelines reporting for Major League Rugby on Root Sports and a host of other stations. See, there's really nothing that this uh, whip smart woman can't do. Uh, Jessamine, why did you decide to get into this crazy broadcast business? Yeah, I'm still trying to figure that out, actually. Um, <laughs> but uh, I guess I, I'll just say a little bit about my background that I grew up in a football household. Um, my dad uh, was a college football coach my entire life, and he just retired actually um, last year. So I, I kind of grew up in sports, but um, I played them too. Um, I played volleyball, basketball, 
and ran track all throughout high school. Then I played college volleyball too. So I knew that I wanted to be in sports, but you know, when you're 18, you kind of, you have to figure it out. <laughs> um, so the school I went to Springfield college was um, just based. Everything uh, was an athletic program. Uh, you know, if you had any sort of major, it was sports related with a sports emphasis. So I started out um, in, uh, in, uh, I forget what I started out, outdoor recreation, didn't like that very much. And uh, my English professor picked me up and asked me to join the sports journalism program. And so I did, and I got to write, I got to, um, you know, work in TV. I got to, the only thing I really didn't do was radio. And so um, when I graduated, I got picked up by ESPN um, about six months after graduation and to just I just took whatever job they would hire me for because they figured, you know, to once we get in the door, we'll teach you what we want you to know. And if you have an eye and an ear for what's relevant, we'll teach you everything else. So I, I just took the job because those four letters meant a lot to me in that major. And um, I ended up just learning as I went from some great producers and great pe people around me. Um, I was a production assistant to start and worked my way up to producing NFL programming on the weekends. And then three years after working at ESPN, I got a call that they were starting a station called 710 ESPN Seattle and that uh, we were going to have the Mariners and we were going to have the Seahawks. So that is a nice little base when you have a new station is having flagships. And I just decided it was safe enough and risky enough for me to do it. And I picked up everything, got in my car and drove across the country. And that was now 10 years ago. So um, I've been, uh, worked my way up from executive producer, or producer to executive producer. Um, uh, in 2012, I applied for the sideline reporting job for Washington State on IMD Network and I got it, which shocked me because I hadn't done it before, but I said I knew I could do it. <laughs> And then um, three years ago, I got asked to fill in. They needed a sideline reporter and couldn't fly anyone in for CBS Sports Network for Major League Rugby. I didn't know anything about it. So I just said, screw it, I'll learn. And I did. I studied the sport for two weeks and then got picked up by the Seawolves full time. Um, so I did all of their games that were non-network and then a few playoff games that were network. And this past year, which was cut short, I ended up working directly for the league and doing all national games. So I kind of just said yes to every opportunity and so I just I just like taking on new things I guess but this is really cool. <laughs> I think that uh, you know uh, these huge leaps of faith um, are, are sort of something you will find across the board with this panel no doubt about it. Thanks Jessamine. Um, next up we have Kim Eng and uh, we would probably call her our headliner, and maybe uh, by doing this alphabetically, I have buried the lead, if you will. Um, she is so impressive. Uh, she is clearly a work your way from the bottom to the top story. Kim started out as an intern for the White Sox. I'm going to skip to all the best stuff. Uh, she was hired by the Yankees as an assistant general manager. They won three World Series titles during her tenure. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. Um, then she was a VP and assistant general manager with the Dodgers. And then since 2011, she is the senior vice president of baseball operations of Major League Baseball. Kim, thank you so much. Welcome. And we so appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Um, Amanda, I do want to let you know that Sue Falsoni and I work together in L.A., so very cool that she is the reason that you uh, decided to pursue this, this line. Um, so basically I started out in a very similar way. Um, loved uh, softball, loved sports when I was a kid. Played softball at the University of Chicago uh, where I was a public policy major. And we had to write a senior thesis. And because I was going to be spending so much time doing it, I really wanted to take a you know, to pick a, a subject that I was really going to embrace. So I thought about sports and I found Title IX, which is basically a federal statute that does not allow any institution or organization that receives federal funding um, to discriminate based on gender. So um, did that research, got to know people at the Women's Sports Foundation, got to know the history of uh, University of Chicago and women's sports and it really has a historic place there. Um, and 
at that point I decided, well, how can I actually get into sports and, and, you know, what would, what would be a great path? Um, and at the same time, I was actually applying for jobs in, in, um, the finance world. Luckily no one hired me there. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I was at UFC, I was, I did almost everything. Sports. I was sports editor of the yearbook, sports editor of the newspaper, president of the Women's Athletic Association. So I was obviously very involved and all the coaches knew me. And it was through this networking that they knew that I was looking for a job in sports. So I was working on campus for about six months. And one of my former coaches said, are you still looking for something in sports? I said, absolutely. She said, the White Sox just called. They're looking for an intern. Get your resume down there. So whipped it out, got it down there, um, interviewed twice and got the internship. So very fortunate from there. Um, yeah, I worked there six years in Chicago. Went on to work in New York um, at the American League office when there was one was there for 14 months and again that whole networking um, uh, concept got me my job helped to get me my job with the New York Yankees and Brian Cashman because when I was working at the league office um, created this whole great network that I wouldn't have known if I had stayed in my job at Chicago because now I got to know all the different clubs and so um, from there, got to really know Brian Cashman, he hired me as, an, as his assistant, was there four years, three World Series rings later, um, and went to LA for nine years and then ended up here in New York as an SVP. Excellent. I, I look forward to hearing uh, more details uh, along the way as we go um, throughout things this afternoon. Um, next up, we have Ingrid Russell Narciss, and I get to uh, run into her quite a bit around T-Mobile Park and come away impressed every single time I end up uh, working with her on something. Another um, graduate from the University of Washington, she is as tough as they come, and I think that happens when you play for a legendary hard-nosed coach like Chris Goldberg. Um, after dabbling in a few things right after college, she joined the Mariners in 1993, and she showed the exact same grit that she had on the basketball court as she rose through the ranks to senior director of corporate sponsorship, handling many of the Mariners' largest and most important partnerships. Um, also, she is paying it forward to many young women in the region. 2019, Ingrid was honored by the University of Washington Women in Business Program as their Woman of the Year. Ingrid. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Angie. Uh, what, a, what an intro. Um, and also, thank you for creating this platform and this forum. Um, such a wonderful way to kind of inspire the next generation of woman executive uh, in, you know, baseball, football, doesn't matter where it is. So, so really appreciate it. And kind of how I got my start. Um, yeah, I was a student at the University of Washington studying architecture. Uh, and then I found out there's math involved. So I quickly switched majors and went to a psychology degree. Um, but um, that whole time, you know, I just kind of uh, reflected uh, on all my wonderful positive uh, coaching and mentoring experiences I, I did. I had a wonderful coach in Chris Gobrecht who um, just encouraged me to kind of stay in sports. And I loved it so much and um, didn't know how I was going to get here. Um, but uh, believed I could just because she instilled that in me. She just had always told us uh, that, you know, you really can do anything you decide you want to do. Um, I took a circuitous route to get to the Mariners, though, We're working for Toys R Us uh, and then the Puget Sound Business Journal. But uh, when I got here, finally at the Mariners in 1993, um, in ticket sales, there was a work stoppage. Um, not long after I started work, so I was actually out of sports for a while. Um, but the minute uh, baseball resumed, came back in a different capacity to work in the sponsorship and the partnership arena and um, have loved it ever since. You know, there are, um, you know, when I was playing basketball at the University of Washington, I was really only aware of just the things that centered and focused around the sport, you know, the trainers, the coaches. Um, Sometimes they have time entertainment, but um, the, the more I kind of got exposed to just the different areas of, of, of baseball and, and, and what it takes to kind of operate a team and um, fell in love with the partnership side of the business um, because you do, you get a chance to, um, you know, not only 
generate revenue for the team, but you also get to help some of your partners um, engage with the fan bases of, of, of each uh, of the team. So um, I love what I do. Um, I'm so grateful and thankful to all those women who kind of um, put me on this path. Uh, you know, Chris Gilbert being one of them. I also got a chance to watch your career too, Angie, as you were coming through. Um, but um, appreciative of all those ladies who kind of um, created the opportunity for me. Yeah, hearing uh, the message um, and the power of having somebody like Chris believe in mm -hmm. you is, yeah. uh, is really uh, mm -hmm. uh, amazing to hear. Next up, uh, we've got Heather Tarr, head coach for the University of Washington and the US uh, U19 national team. I want to say this, the panel here is like my kids. I don't have a favorite, but our next panelist tests that theory. Um, Heather had an impressive softball career at the University of Washington. They were very fortunate. She returned to coach them in 2005. Since then, all she's done is go on to win a national championship at the helm and become the winningest coach of any sport in Washington history over her 16 seasons. Uh, she is also the coach for the U.S. national team. Um, but again, I don't want everyone to think she is my favorite just because she is my favorite. I mean, don't, <laughs> don't think you're my favorite just because you are. Okay, Heather. And thanks. Um, thanks to the Mariners for putting this on. It's just an honor to be in this group of women, um, including yourself, Angie. And I, I just... Um, you know, I wasn't quite sure what to expect, but oh my gosh, looking across the screen and seeing everybody, I'm excited to hear and learn from everybody, but I've just been so lucky to be involved in sports my whole life. I mean, of course, growing up, um, enjoying all sports as a youth person growing up in this area, in the Seattle area and Redmond specifically, playing little league baseball, being the only girl a lot of times and all of the things that I would do baseball wise. I mean, I, I thought I was going to be the first major league baseball player that was a female back, you know, in the late eighties. And soon enough, once I uh, didn't grow the Adam's apple that all the boys had when I was 15, I decided, well, I probably can't keep doing this for much longer. So unfortunately I had to start playing with the bigger ball and the bigger ball, which is the softball has taken me to the most amazing places um, to this day. I cannot believe I've been at the University of Washington coaching for 16 years. I feel like Benjamin Button. I think I get younger every year, but my hair tells me otherwise, and my body kind of tells me, no, that's not true. But uh, I feel like I won the lottery being able to come back and coach at my alma mater, coach softball, and be able to um, aim to empower the women that we get to recruit to the University of Washington every single day to be the greatest versions of themselves and try to win games along the way and uh, Angie, uh, I know you know the impact you've made in my life, uh, being able to play with you. And uh, again, I always brag about being able to be coached by you. And um, one of the best coaches that we've ever had come out of the University of Washington isn't coaching. She's sitting right there with her awesome boys and family behind her. But um, just always proud to be associated with you and those that you surround yourself with. So uh, that's, that's, I guess, my, my spiel for now. That was awesome. Uh, Heather uh, just mentioned the fact that she played Little League Baseball here in the Seattle area. Coming up a little bit later, I cannot wait to introduce uh, all of you to our youngest panelist ever, uh, Cora Morgan, a 13-year-old baseball player who was waiting in the wings to really take over the world, uh, but already accomplishing some amazing things. We'll, uh, we'll uh, get a chance to speak with her a little bit later. But right now, um, I want to start um, hitting you with questions uh, that we have collected for you. And uh, Kim, I'm going to start with you in regards to, and not because you're the oldest or have the most uh, you know, advice to give, but um, what advice would you give to women entering a very male-dominated profession? Right. So I think, look, um, I think we always have to be thoroughly prepared. Um, unfortunately, we're still at a point where we're going to have to outshine the guys to get noticed, to get promoted. Um, I think, number two, you have to have a voice. Um, you're going to have to, at many points in your career, stand up you're going to have to make a case for yourself or a case for whatever it is you're trying to, to get across. Um, and then lastly, I think you're going to need to have thick, thick skin. Um, if you're going to play in this arena, uh, you have to be prepared for, for there to be um, scenarios where you know, not everybody's going to be constructive. 
and there are going to be barbs thrown, and there's going to be you're going to have a little bit of a target on your back. And I think that you know, listen, we just need to be prepared for it. Um, that's just the way it is right now. And uh, you know, to be in this business, to be playing in this arena, uh, you just have to be up for the task. Uh, Jessamine, I'll go to you next. And even though we're constantly seeing uh, the broadcast world uh, evolve, it is still a very male dominated profession. Yeah, it certainly is. And I mean, I knew that getting into it. Um, I think that more of the things that I needed to overcome came in subtleties rather than overt sexism or things like that. But there's always this fear, uh, kind of some, similar to what Kim said about uh, having to outshine the boys, is that you can't make mistakes. Because if you make a mistake, it's because you're a woman and you don't belong. If a guy makes a mistake, he made that mistake. And so I've always felt that I have to work double. I have to be double prepared. I have to be extra prepared to do anything. And one of the things that I notice about, I, I run our internship program at 710. And um, when we aren't taking on interns, I talk to every single person that applies. And there are a lot of young women. And since sideline reporting was really the only way to get an in into the field, I feel like young women all think that's all they can do in sports broadcasting is, is be a sideline reporter and everything that comes along with that, where, you know, the hair, the makeup, the look, and only this many make it. No, I mean, I, I got to meet Beth Bowens a few years ago and I fangirled over her harder than I have any athlete I've ever met in my life. It was awesome. She was so sweet and she talked to me for a while. She was broadcasting um, the, for ESPN doing the, um, the, the game for television. She was play by play. And so, I look at her now and, you know, Doris Burke and people who are doing much more in a broadcasting sense than just sideline reporting. And then I have other people that want to be engineers, want to be producers, and they don't know how a woman should take that path. And like I said, it is getting better, but that is something that I constantly see. And I want people to know that there are just so many more avenues. Yeah, and I would say even in our office, and this isn't pat myself on the back, but um, you know, the men that work in my office uh, on the, the broadcast side of things, on the on-air things, and many that I've worked with throughout the years weren't necessarily athletes. Uh, I would say you know, I had a, a far uh, longer uh, um, athletic background than, than the men that I worked with. Um, but again, it's not, you know, it's not important. It's not necessary, but it just goes to the point. A lot of times people think, well, he can do it because he's a guy and he must've played sports. I'm like, yeah, most of them don't. And especially like, and I won't mention any names, but some really high end, you know, male nerds that have never even touched a baseball or a football and, you know, have no clue when it comes to athleticism. Amanda, I have to imagine, I mean, because seeing women in these on-field roles, I mean, people are just like, I'm sorry, what do you do? Like, I mean, that has, they have to still be double taking with you. Yeah. So for me, yeah, it's a little different. I'm the only female around ever, like in my league last year in at the Mariners facility, like I'm the only female. So thankfully I work for a great organization who knows I'm there, is decent around me and is very, very respectful to my presence. So I'm very thankful for that. But yeah, my favorite question is, what is it like being the only female? Well, it's like exactly what you expect. I get called mom every single day. And it's like having a bunch of older brothers that I never wanted, just picked on constantly. So that kind of piggies back off of Kim. Like you have to have thick skin, like coming into this, like as what the guys would consider soft, like I'm kind of soft. Like I get my feelings hurt easily, but like being around the field, you can't show that. You gotta, you gotta be tough, you gotta give it back to them. So it's definitely different, but I love it. Like I knew what I was getting myself into in college. I pretty much only worked male sports so it's just something I've been used to you just got to know what you're getting yourself into be professional about it and have tough skin uh Kim I'm also a huge fan of title nine I'm going to direct this question to Heather Tarr but but with this caveat um in 1972 before title nine 90 percent um of women women held 90 percent of the head coaching jobs in sports, but all of a sudden you have this flood of money and everything else and, and resources into the university. And unfortunately, 2016, 
while more women play college sports than ever, now just 40% of NCAA women's teams have a female head coach, Heather. Well, I think that just speaks to the fact that men love coaching women. And <laughs> that's really what it's all about. And you can get paid to do it. But I think the other thing is there's going to be a wave that's going to start somehow, some way. It already has in the NBA and, of course, in the NFL and a little bit in Major League Baseball is that women can coach men. I mean, women raise men. So why wouldn't you be able to coach men? But unfortunately, I think either maybe women don't want to be involved in, in the locker room and with the guys and maybe haven't really, you know, stepped into the ranks of being able to do so. But I think the times are starting to change. And um, again, men, men enjoy coaching women. We have men on our coaching staff and they're, they love it. I mean, they'll never probably go back to coaching um, men's sports because they love the female athlete. But I think there's something to be said for the influence of a woman um, in a leadership position in a, in a male dominated uh, industry. And I think coaching men and women coaching men, I think we're just scratching the surface to that. Ingrid, give me an idea of how the sports landscape has changed since you started your career. Um, you know, it has, uh, uh, it's, it's changed quite a bit. Uh, and in many ways it hasn't. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, back in the day, I think before I even got into sports, my sports heroines were, uh, you know, Tony Stone from the Indianapolis Clowns and uh, Effa Manley, who owned the Newark um, Eagles in uh, the Negro Leagues, um, you know, and those would have been great places uh, to starting points to build on, you know, a woman who played and a woman who owned the team. Um, but, you know, it's it's just one of those things that's been wonderful to watch the careers of, you know, our own Kim Ng here and Amanda, um, you know, and, you know, ladies like that, I'm convinced, you know, they're responsible for some of the growth that we're seeing um, in, in, in all the sports. Um, so um, it, it's changed a lot, um, you know, in that we're starting to see opportunities and, you know, people like Kim come through and Becky Hammond from uh, the, the NBA and Nancy Lieberman, coaches like that. Um, but still such a long, long, long way to go. Kim, um, the same question to you, uh, because you have seen this throughout the years. I mean, how, how has it changed um, since you first began? Well, yeah, I think... Um, I would say at Major League Baseball in the last five years, I think we've seen a lot of activation, um, but it was a little bit more quiet prior to that. Um, you know, what you're seeing now is a lot more um, structured, formal programming um, in order to try and get more women and people of color into the game. And for that, you know, I'm very encouraged. Um, you know, but as Ingrid said, there's still way more that we need to have accomplished. You know, in my uh, career, one of my favorite things that I get to do is to um, go inside uh, the cage with the players or to go out on the field and do the inside game uh, tricks of the trade and, and hear them talk about the game and break down the game. I miss, you know, um, that aspect of playing. And it's not so much about the winning and the losing, but I just, and I, you know, to Heather's Point. I, I remember when I was coaching uh, just out of college, it just, th that's what you do. You, you sit there and you, you go back and forth about, um, you know, how are we going to get this kid going? And, you know, I saw this aha moment in this kid and, and it's, it's such a big part of who I am as a broadcaster, I think, is my background in sports. And I'm curious how your time as an athlete helped shape uh, your career in sports today. Jessamyn, I'll, uh, I'll throw this to you first. Yeah, sure. I think help, it, it really helped that um, I knew the inner workings of a locker room, whether it be, you know, women's, men's, I mean, a locker room's a locker room, and kind of understanding how teams communicate, how they work together, um, especially having played in college. And I think because I started writing while I was in college, that's mostly what I did was I wrote. Um, I, I went to other schools to interview their athletes, and because they were my same age, and they knew I was an athlete, I felt like there was some rapport there. It's kind of an unspoken rapport. As soon as I said I played a sport, it, I, I had more respect or it, it felt a little bit more comfortable. Um, you know, I, I would go up to UMass all the time, um, you know, just because uh, they had a better football and basketball program than we did. And so I wanted to write about their athletes. 
Um, so, and then on campus, you know, we, there was just such a brotherhood. There's such a sisterhood. Like we're, we're all brethren. And moving beyond that, um, the, the team aspect, um, you know, understanding what an athlete's going through when they get injured. Um, you know, I think all of us who have played a sport know what it's like to go through a devastating injury. And just understanding an athlete's mentality just really helped me get more comfortable around them, I think. And Ingrid, I imagine some of your uh, most important and uh, lifelong lessons happened probably out on the basketball court and not necessarily in a classroom with, uh, with your um, career as an athlete in college. Um, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, you love all these wonderful things about s sports. And, and for me, um, you know, I, I'll go back to it a lot, the mentoring, um, you know, the, the coaching, the mentoring. Um, those are the things that, uh, you know, I've always wanted to replicate kind of at this level, uh, things I wanted to do for people coming, um, after me, but, but you're, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, you know, wonderful thing too, uh, just in terms of influence, um, you know, when you're playing a sport, you are constantly trying to find that next gear, trying to push and, and get beyond your, you know, believed ability uh, and get to that potential, whatever that's supposed to be. Um, you know, and, I, and we love to replicate this too here in the office. Um, you know, it's the coaching and the training and, and uh, the, the, the competitiveness um, that you take from from your playing experience and bring that into the office um, and just letting people know that there really is no ceiling um, if you, if you keep working. And again, I can actually ask that question to every single one of you, but Kim, I, I want to, uh, to know if you're able to recall maybe a moment in your career where you faced adversity specifically because of your gender and how did you push past that challenge? Um, I, and I can, don't mean yesterday because I'm sure <laughs> I can tell you that every day of my career, I think you're, you are battling perception, um, whether it's out on the field and with the players or the coaching staff or in the office. You know, sometimes it, the office guys are worse than the guys out on the field. Um, so can I narrow it down to one? I think it's a little tough, um, you know, but in terms of the way that, you know, I tried to deal with it. I think, you know, to a certain extent, you have to educate. I think you have to let people know who you are and you have to do it patiently. And when I say that, I mean either name and title or it's just that you know your stuff, right? And sometimes that's just a much longer process than we want it to be. Um, you know, sometimes you have to be a little bit, let's say, bullish with it and you have to make people understand who you are. Um, I can give you one example. Um, I was in an arbitration hearing early, early in my career. Um, I was probably 26 years old or so, and I was presenting the case against a player. Um, well, for, and I was really extraordinarily nervous, really, really nervous. Um, yeah, there was $650,000 on the line. and the player I noticed from across the table, the player is actually sitting across the table from you. Um, he was staring me down, trying to intimidate me. And so, that work out? yeah, not so well for him. So at that point, you know, you, you're, you're processing all of this and, and you really have to make a very conscious decision of how you're going to approach it. And you can wilt like a flower, or you can, or that, that athlete in you um, kicks in and you confront it and you confront it hard. So with every, with every page that I was taking them through in the, in the brief, I got stronger and stronger. And then I started looking him in the eye and to see what his reaction was at that point. Yeah. The good thing is that the lucky thing, good thing, we, we won the case. Um, you know, was it my presentation? I can't say that it was, but it, you know, if I hadn't done well, then for sure we wouldn't have won. So, you know, call it what you may, but you know, those, those types of situations define who you are and you learn from them. Um, and I think we all, you know, again, as athletes um, really pull from, from what is really second nature to us and that's to fight and to, you know, to battle. 
And, you know, we might look like we can't battle just because we're women, but, um, you, you know, uh, sorry for them if they're going to underestimate us. Um, and then I guess lastly, I can tell you that you, know, you have to have a sense of humor every once in a while, um, because there's no way you can deal with every day if you don't have a sense of humor. You, you'll drive yourself nuts. Um, I was an assistant GM uh, on a road trip with the Dodgers. And you know, typically the way you load up, a plane, load, load up the plane after a, a game is the staff goes on, they sit in the first class area, and then the players board. So the players were boarding, staff had all sat down, the flight attendant came over and she's asking us for, you know, what we wanted to drink. She came over to me and she said, so what did you do to get on this flight? And I said, do you really want to know? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, you see all these guys? And she said, yeah. And I said, they all report to me. <laughs> nice. And she just virtually crawled away. So, um, but, you know, again, you, you, you know, sometimes you just have to do that. And, you know, in a harmless situation, you can. So anyway. Uh, Amanda, same sort of idea, uh, you know, as you are just beginning um, this and, and hopefully, you know, more minds are changing about women and what they can accomplish. But I have to imagine that at some point you've faced some sort of adversity because of your gender. Every single day, especially like I know I'm a female in a male dominant world. Like I knew that getting into this, I knew what to expect. You just have to work with it. And we have to keep pushing, proving that we're just as good as anybody to get that same respect. And so slowly, we're slowly starting to see some changes, but we have a long way to go. So for me, every single day, especially on the road, like the clubhouses are not built for a female at all. So for me, like my training room is either normally in the middle of the locker room. So like when the players are changing before games, especially after games, like our spreads are normally set up in the, the clubhouse. So like after games, guys are going in, showering, um, changing clothes. Like we're trying to get on the bus to get out of there as soon as possible. So like a lot of the times that means one, I'm busy doing my job and two, I don't get a chance to eat because I can't go into the locker room. So thankfully, like the team I had last year, unbelievable respectful they knew I was there they took really good care of me but even like during a game in between innings if I need to run up to the restroom real quick there's nowhere to go where am I supposed to go I have to go wait on the concourse with everybody else that's trying to go to the restroom in the middle of a game but I have to be back out there before that next inning starts so I face it every day um the first couple weeks getting into it was a little difficult I just had to figure out a way to do it after the games getting on the bus all the players get to take a shower I've been outside for the last 12 hours also I'm sweaty and gross and we have a 15 hour eight hour bus trip back home I'm not sitting on that bus sweaty gross but there's nowhere for me to shower so you just have to figure it out like I would wait for the umpires to leave and then once they cleared out of their locker room I was the last one to like go in and use their shower so it's unfortunate that we don't have the same thing that the males do, but you just have to figure it out and we just have to keep pushing to get things better for us because we deserve the same thing. Yes. No I think that that's something that women so often have to find a way to adapt and something that, you know, because we have that ability to do that, it, it makes us stronger and to be able to, to do the things that we are able to do. Jessamine, I, I know for a fact you have never, never had any sort of adversity or, or had anything happen just because uh, you were a female in, uh, in broadcasting or in a locker room. No. <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. And um, I forget who said it, I think it was Kim, that most of the adversity that I faced did not happen because of coaches or athletes um, at all. It, um, it, it was people outside and people who I work with and around. Um, for instance, my very first day at ESPN, you know, a 22 year old fresh out of college was not going to be great for me. And, uh, and I, I, very prominent, personality came into the control room and got down on his knee in front of my new three bosses and he proposes to me he said you look great you smell great why don't you just marry me and everybody laughed and I how am I supposed to react in that situation my literal bosses are finding this hilarious 
this guy, I'm going to need to be on his good side if I'm going to get ahead there. Um, and that kind of thing, that was very, that's a, a very tame example of some of the things um, that as a young woman, I faced there and feeling so isolated because everyone else thought it was funny and I'm brand new. So I did not feel as though I could stand up for myself in, you know, the, with the chutzpah that I usually would in real life because I had to maintain this relationship. And I mean, I literally remember receiving texts and saying, oops, I think you meant this for your wife. And that's, that's just the way I had to navigate this. And I'm like, that's my way of saying no, but we're cool because I told you that and I'm going to laugh. And I feel like I'm constantly to this day always playing a dance um, around that. And obviously I'm treated that way because I'm a woman. Um, yeah, but th those ones really stand out, especially because it happened to me when I was very young and um, I hadn't developed a system of how to deal with that. I hadn't developed any rapport with anyone and I hadn't developed the skin that I have now. It is very true. There are things that I, I let slide or go by uh, when I first began in this business and never in a million years, you know, would I allow to have happen now, but that's only because I didn't have that stature. There's no way I could have stood up against that player, you know, who was saying those things when I first began, because, you know, if I was going to cause trouble, you know, he wasn't going to leave. I was. Um, Heather, you know, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing uh, women in sports? And what do you think will be the biggest challenge for the next generation uh, behind you? Gosh, I think just um, being, I think those that really want to do it, one, um, that's going to increase. I think just women in general are seeing opportunity in more male dominated, ar dominated arenas. I, I think that's changing. But I also still think, um, you know, not to take this lightly, but it's, it's uh, systematic. It's become systematic, much like other things that are going on right now is the belief systems of, of humans, of who can do what. I mean, you see it on all, all of these women that are having these, um, you know, pre preconceived notions about uh, gender or, you know, what your role would be in a, in a male dominated world. Um, you know, I, I still get it with, with two guys on our coaching staff, uh, two women, two men. I mean, the first thing that happens when you go to the airport is like, okay, um, you know, you, you must be the coach, you know, they'll point to one of the men and it's just so funny how the perception is. I mean, what I, I don't know, like, what do you have to do to, to change that? I think it's just going to take more time and more of us that are in the positions of um, influence, whether that be you know, just today on this call, being able to have, you know, a Taryn Atley, one of our student athletes who does want to get into the business, know that she doesn't necessarily have to go through the, you know, she doesn't have to be a sideline reporter to get into it, um, all those things. I just think it's going to take some time, but, you know, people still need to want to do it, you know, and all of you guys who have succeeded and got so far up in your ranks within um, the careers that you're in, you know, you, you've been pioneers and now behind you, there's going to be three or four more women that want to do what you do. And I think it's just going to take, uh, you know, women like yourselves and us that can really, you know, stand, stand next to a male in the, in the industry and be able to compete um, from a knowledge base, uh, from an opportunity base and uh, continue to just thrive and be great in what you're doing. Yeah. And I think when you look at this amazing panel of women, you know, I believe you could probably label this group of women as uh, trailblazers, uh, but unfortunately, while that would be catchy and it would be accurate, uh, Major League Baseball and USA Baseball um, already kind of took that on. And in 2017, uh, they launched a baseball tournament around Jackie Robinson Day. And this, this tournament um, was for about 100 girls to play in. And Cora Morgan from Shoreline was one of those girls chosen. I mentioned to uh, refer to you guys earlier, Leading up to this panel, I spoke with Cora, and I think you will agree uh, she's a talented, sharp young lady. All right, Cora, uh, congratulations. It, it is so cool, even though they didn't have the tournament this year, that you were selected to the Trailblazers. Tell me about the day you found out uh, that you made it. We were watching a movie in my living room, and my dad, my dad's working on his computer, and he opens the email thing. And then, like, he looks at me, and I'm looking at him like, what? what is, what's going on? And so 
he like and he hands me his phone because his emails on his phone also and so he hands me his phone and I see it and like like everything just shuts off like I was in like I almost started crying actually I did start crying you're, you're making me tear up right now it's <laughs> like this like I I told everyone about it like it's in honor really because I'm one in 97 I think mm-hmm When I started playing baseball, I never thought that it would, like, it would go up to here. Like, I was just like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play baseball. I'm gonna be good at what I do. It's gone so far, and I'm really, like, I'm really happy. Yeah, I get to be among, like, hundreds of, hopefully thousands in the future of women in baseball and who are defying gender stereotypes of oh women can't play baseball because blah 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 you know of course some people will say why why baseball why do you have to play baseball why why can't you just play softball what do you say to them i say i play baseball because it's where i belong i've always loved the game it's been a part of my life since i can remember it's my life it's (laughs) it's everything about me baseball is such a big part of me and I tried softball. It wasn't really the the right fit for me. And I came back, I came back on my dad's team with my brother and a couple of my friends. And I just, like the first season, I just had fun. Like it was the happiest I think I felt in, like I'd felt in a long time because I was, I was where I wanted to be. Yeah, because what was the difference for you? Is there anything that you can pinpoint? Because you grew up playing baseball. You did try and cross over, go play softball, but then you ended up switching back to baseball. Is there anything you could sort of pinpoint as to, to why? Um, the biggest difference is just the team vibe. Like with softball, it was more like, oh, you make friends. You don't really take the game. It's just a game. But with baseball, like when I first started baseball, it was like, yes, have fun. This is what it's all about. Baseball is a fun game. And now it's more like, have fun, make friends. Also, be good at what you do. Now, one thing that has really impressed me um, is the support that you get from your parents, especially your dad, because I always kind of used to be frustrated as a, as a young girl because I didn't feel like maybe – my dad was supporting me all that much because in his mind, he had an idea of what a girl could do. And, and it was very finite. Um, it seems like that's not the case at all with your parents and specifically your dad, that, that they've been really supportive throughout this whole process. Yeah, my, dad's, my dad was actually the one who suggested I come play baseball because like, he's always said, if you're doing what makes you happy, then you're doing the right thing. And softball at the time for me it did not make me happy and he was like hey come play baseball try it out if you don't like it cool and this this is where I am now he's always been like by my side he's been pushing me to do new things like and I think really the big part that's like gotten me to where I am is him like recording me with hitting and throwing and everything and like posting it up to social media so like I will always have that reminder of where I was and where I am now. What do you hope um, will happen with uh, girls and uh, women in regards to baseball in the future? I hope that some people can learn to be like a lot more open-minded like baseball is a fun game everyone should be uh, able to and allowed to play because Base, baseball shouldn't be America's pastime if it isn't for everyone. For all Americans, that's right. You know, uh, Pete Carroll said something recently. It's not necessarily that we need change, but we need progress. And uh, Cora, this is absolutely fantastic uh, seeing you because I believe you are the uh, progress that is going to affect that change. Thanks so much. And I look forward to watching you flourish in the future. Thank you so much. I thought it was uh, really important to include uh, Cora in this conversation uh, just because, you know, that is sort of the next wave. But 
this group right here, I mean, you are the ones that, that paved you know, uh, the way, and, and Heather, I'll start with you. You actually did play little league baseball and, and had some incredible experiences um, that, that you know, have followed you throughout your softball career. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, not knowing it at the time, uh, 1987, Redmond South against Redmond North, uh, you know, our Rangers team against the Angels. I'm 12, uh, you know, I'm the only girl in, in, in the, on the field. And we are maybe, you know, winning the game five to one at the time. Maybe it's the third inning. And my teammate, Jeff D'Amico, uh, he, he's a, he was a pretty big time guy in our area when I grew up, but uh, he was up to bat and the bases were loaded and I was on deck and I was just doing my thing, doing my routine. And all of a sudden I was like, wait, they're walking him. You're walking this guy and the bases are loaded. A run's going to come in. And, you know, so you're thinking about that. And then all of a sudden I'm like, they're walking Jeff D'Amico to get to me. What the heck? And so here I go, I step into the box and, um, I, I don't know if it was the first pitch, but it, it was uh, it was a swing I took, and the ball went over the fence, and here I go. This story that probably still lives on to this day, where they walk Jeff D'Amico to put a you know run in, and they to pitch to the girl, and um, I you know hit a grand slam home run behind him. And uh, that Jeff D'Amico eventually would make it to uh, the majors, and it's just a shame, Heather, that uh, you are not playing in there, um, Ingrid. What do you think is the most significant barrier to female leadership, uh, women in power positions to, to, to add them, you know, to, is it, is it getting out the old guard? I mean, what, what needs to happen? Significant barrier. Um, yeah, you know, uh, getting out the old guard, all of that, you know, part of it too, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge believer in, and I've said it already, um, just, you know, belief that we can do it. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, sometimes we have these notions about what we can and can't do. Our self-talk sometimes um, can be so negative. Um, but, um, you know, really just kind of believing that, that we can get in there and, and lead. Um, you know, and the other thing I'll say is just, you know, it would um, help if we had uh, more leadership, more women uh, in leadership positions um, at the, you know, Major League Baseball and, and other areas. You know, there's something to be said about um, seeing yourself um, in someone else's shoes um, that's ahead of you. So. Um, you know, opening up that pipeline to the executive le of level, getting more women in there um, and encouraging each other and bringing them along, I think, um, uh, would also help. What about you, uh, Kim? Uh, what do you think needs to happen? And I want to say when I say old guard, it's kind of one of those things I, I talk about sometimes just men and it's, I don't want to say it's not their fault. And I always say also I'm raising, you know, men who will really seek out and, and appreciate strong women. But sometimes there are men that um, they just have a, just an idea of what a woman can accomplish uh, just because they haven't known enough strong women, I think, or, or people, women achieve things uh, and, and get in those positions of power, Kim. Yeah, no, absolutely. Look, the, the most significant barrier is the lack of opportunity or the, that People don't make enough opportunities for women um, to lead. Um, I think that you know, a lot of education and training needs to go on at the upper levels of organizations. I think um, you know, they need to have an understanding of what it looks like. You know, so just one, one or two or um, you know, women at the upper ranks would really help and have an you know, I think when you don't interact with women and when you, and you at, the, at those levels, I think there's really just a horrible impression that you have, you know, women cannot do it when that is absolutely categorically not true. Um, and so I just, I agree with you. I don't think many uh, men in the upper ranks have been exposed to, you know, competent, capable women. They don't, they just don't know what it looks like. Um, but a lot of this has to start from the top. You know, this is absolutely a top-down um, approach that we need to work on. 
um, we can, you know, and one of the things that, you know, that I, that I see and I find is that, you know, there, a lot of times we try the bottom up approach, which is good in terms of execution, but undoubtedly you will come up against, you know, an obstacle and it might not be a big obstacle, but that is just an excuse for us to then just, you know, throw our hands up in the air and say, okay, well, it didn't work. That's not right. It will work, but you need support from the top, period. Amanda, what do you think um, from your vantage point, what are the steps that you would like to see the sports community take to make sure that gender equity is achieved? One, just like Kim was saying, just the opportunities. Like We have to be given the same opportunities. I know of several people who have applied for athletic training positions in Major League Baseball organizations, and they literally changed their name on their resumes before they sent it in initially to more of a male name. So they're given, like, when they get that first call, they're kind of thrown off guard, like, oh, this isn't your name. Well, yeah, because a lot of people do believe you see a girl name on there, they just skip right past you. And unfortunately, especially with the older coaches and um, employees of, especially in baseball, when they grew up, there was no such thing as a female in baseball. Like, we kind of are looked down on because we don't belong there, according to them. Like, they're, in my opinion, they're one of the harder ones to work with because that's just not how they, they've been in baseball for 60 years, and that's just not what they're used to. So I feel like one of the main huge barriers is just the opportunities. Like, we just really don't have that opportunity yet. Heather, what do you uh, think on this subject? Oh, my. I think, you know, it definitely is education and it, it, I believe it, I get, agree it's an opportunity, but I do think it's, it's self-belief too. I mean, if you, you really have to believe you can do something to be able to do it. Nobody can do it for you, but then what causes that belief and where does that belief system stem from? And I think it's just uh, continued opportunities, continued women being in this position, but continued advocacy because you have to help the person behind you. You can't just you know, as a sole woman in, in an industry, you can't just be like, all right, I'm good. I, you know, I, I can do this. Well, there, you, we have the duty, I think, to look back behind us and help provide some of those opportunities and advocate and, um, you know, help, help ed educate others because women do have a, a huge place in these industries. Mm -hmm. And I think the industries are going to be stuck until women really get an opportunity to influence each in, in every level, in all you know, walks of life, whether it is in broadcasting or it is in college athletics or professional athletics. You know, th this panel discussion uh, shouldn't be uh, constrained uh, to time, but unfortunately, is that, but we need like four or five hours to sort of hash this out, especially with uh, this group of women that we have got. But before uh, we go and bef as we wrap things up, yeah, um, I'm wondering, the best piece of advice you ever received. Uh, one thing for me is, you know, people don't always remember your actions, but they remind, they never forget, you know, the way you made them feel, um, good or bad. And, and for me, I've always really tried to be genuine with everybody I come in contact with. And Jessamyn, I'm gonna start with you. Just um, throughout the years, just a, a, a bit of advice that, that always stuck with you. You know, uh, I was thinking back to my time at ESPN and this advice came from Dan Patrick. Um, I, I had only been there about a year and um, I got to fill in as uh, an AP on that show for about three months while someone was out for personal leave. And um, first of all, I was treated as an equal. I was a 24 year old production assistant getting to work with one of the highest known sports broadcasters out there, Dan Patrick and everybody's opinion mattered. I was the only female working on that show, believe it or not. Um, so there are you know, four producers and Dan and a male board up. So we all weighed in on everything. He wanted my opinions, he wanted everything, um, everything that he wanted from everyone else. And so after I had really under the wire finished editing an interview just in time for it to be set we hit play and then you know we have eight minutes on tape so he opens the door and says I, I gotta do the fatherly advice thing with you now now that you you officially you know impressed me and he sat me down alone he didn't do this in front of everybody and he just said you know you really got what it takes don't be another cute chick and what he meant 
No, I wasn't offended by that. Uh, what he meant was that a lot of women ride that out and he's seen it in the industry where they don't achieve their fullest potential because the people around them, you know, they're kind of conditioned to, okay, as long as I'm cute and fun and whatever and easy to get along with, well, you're not honing your skills because, you know, I don't think it's their intention on either side, but that's what happens and women don't achieve as much as they could. And that's what he ended up explaining it a lot more eloquently than I just did. But don't be just another cute chick because he's like, you're more than that. And he did it. He tried to intercept me early in my career to give me that advice. And I know that might not sound so PC, but it meant a lot to me. And I, I know exactly what he meant by it. And I have, I took those words and I ran with it because I'm pretty sure I could have slacked off for various reasons or made bad decisions. But when he told me that I had what it took uh, and that I, you know, I was more than the perception of just another cute chick, um, it, it gave me some confidence in my career. You know, Jessamine, that was different than the advice I got. Someone told me once, you're not hot enough to be a token female, so you better work. Oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, Ingrid, uh, uh, best piece of advice you ever got? Um, probably, uh, you know, do something that scares you a little bit. Um, if not daily, then, you know, weekly. Um, you know, public speaking, speaking to people used to be really scary to me. Um, and it's funny when you work in sales, but um, but, uh, we, you know, I know growth and comfort just don't occupy the same space. So, uh, you know, doing something that just challenges me a little bit every day, um, whether that's, um, you know, cold calling was scary to me at one point. Now I'm quite comfortable, um, you know, just uh, challenging myself and expecting more of myself. Um, that was that was some pretty good advice. And, and that and uh, along with it, um, you know, don't be afraid to fail. Uh, it's um, such a huge part of the process and oftentimes, you know, where you learn the most. So those, you said one, but those, <laughs> those two things are probably the, the, the best. They are good pieces of advice. I've never watched uh, anything or I've never learned anything from watching a good show, I always say. <laughs> um, Amanda. So for me, I'm a very self-driven person. I put my mind to something and I'm not going to stop until... I get to where I want to be. So actually just recently before all this craziness started happening, um, sometimes I can see that as a negative thing. I put my mind to something and then I don't stop thinking about that. Like everything I do is to get me to where I want to be. And somebody had recently told me like, don't ever let that little nagging thing that's in the back of your head that's pushing you, don't ever let that little thing go away. Um, so for me, my advice to everybody else, regardless of who you are, like don't let your race, ethnicity, ethnicity, gender, nothing. Don't let anything stop you from getting to where you want to be. It doesn't matter if you want to work in sports or not. If you have a goal, do everything in your power you can to get there and don't let anything trip you up. You're going to fail. You're going to make mistakes, but those just help you grow and get stronger. So that's just my advice for everybody. I think that's great. Uh, Heather, what was the, uh, the best little snippet uh, piece of advice that you ever got? Well, I, I have two. The first one, um, in, in a time where I was so un, I guess, not unprepared, but uh, when I was pursuing the job at the University of Washington, I was told uh, to have a business plan. And I was thinking, what is a business plan? And that literally changed my life. I look back at the business plan I created to apply for this uh, opportunity to be the head coach. And it it has come true. Everything in the business plan actually did come true. Um, so that's, that's one thing, just in pursuing, uh, pursuing what you want to have, uh, have a plan. And the second thing would be, it's a Joe Maddenism, but it came from Ken Revisa, uh, a sports psychologist who is now um, passed on, but his name, is, or his name is Ken Revisa, yeah. Uh, but keep the pleasure greater than the pressure. And I go to that every single time I feel something negative or I feel pressure myself. Um, keep the pleasure greater than the pressure. Uh, that's huge for me and, and for those around me. That's a, that's a great bit of advice. It is so difficult to, you know, perform at a high level uh, when you are uh, nervous. People say, you know, what, when do you get ever nervous uh, interviewing baseball players? No, professional bowler. That was the worst most nervous I ever was because I, I really was worried about being prepared. 
Uh, and Kim, I'm coming um, to you last for a pearl of wisdom uh, in regards to the advice that you've gotten or advice that you have. Well, I've got one of each. Um, probably the best piece of advice I ever got was never let them see you sweat. And then the advice that I would give to a lot of young women is, you know, I believe in simplicity. Um, you want to steer to your strengths, lean to your strengths, tackle areas that you need improvement on, and tackle them one at a time. And then, and then after that, you have to recognize where you've made progress and give yourself credit. Because I think we as women in general, we tend to be perfectionists. And I can tell you that it's pretty hard to have much confidence when you're a perfectionist. So you got to give ourselves a break and we got we to gotta cheer ourselves on for even the small wins. And those will help you build confidence. And when you have confidence, you're going to go knock people dead. I mean, you're just, you're going to conquer the world. Sadly, Kim, what you made me think of is another quote I heard that men and women will never be equal until women can walk down the street with a uh, beer gut and bald uh, <laughs> and think they look good. Look good. <laughs> <laughs> and one other quote or snippet I've always loved to illustrate what women have to do in order to gain equal footing uh, with men is a reminder that Ginger Rogers did everything that Fred Astaire did, but she did it backwards and in heels. And I think it's that talent, that resolve, and that fearlessness that is clearly um, across this board and was so fun to see on display today. I thank you all so much for being part of the Seattle Mariners Women in Sports panel today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. I look forward to uh, the day uh, somewhat, uh, not too much in the distant future when we can all get together at T-Mobile Park. Thank you. Subscribe to the Mariners YouTube channel for the latest Mariners content.